Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, ARK's weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. This week, we're joined by Dr. Larry Karash, the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Cirrus, a patient-centric medtech firm focused on massively improving the safety of the world's blood supply. On this episode, Dr. Karash and I focus on emerging pathogens such as Zika and dengue fever, the FDA's new final guidance on blood safety, and how Cirrus's pathogen inactivation technology, called Intercept, is uniquely positioned to further the security of the blood supply. So for some of our listeners who are unfamiliar already, Larry, if you wouldn't mind, could you maybe briefly set up Cirrus's mission and some of the main issues that you're you're trying to tackle? Yes. Cirrus is a biotechnology company, which is headquartered in Concord, California, east of San Francisco. Uh, we have a European headquarters outside of Amsterdam. The focus of our technology is to improve the safety of blood transfusion. So blood is a critical supportive therapy for healthcare. Approximately 18 million blood components, which consist of red cells, platelets, plasma, and cryoprecipitate, and a small amount of whole blood, are collected each year in the United States. Blood is collected from volunteer donors, and it's separated into what is known as components, the red cells, the platelets, and plasma, because each of these have specific therapeutic indication. Donors are asked a series of questions, and they may be deferred due to travel to regions with risk of infectious disease, and this limits the donor pool. And donors are tested for a limited number of viruses, HIV, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, West Nile virus, syphilis, which is a very old test, and platelets are tested for bacteria, and some blood products are tested for two parasites, trypanosome, cruzi, and, and babesia. The safety of blood transfusion until Cirrus's technology was developed has relied on donor screening and testing, mm -hmm. but this has always been a reactive strategy and has not provided a high level of protection when new infectious agents are recognized and emerge and get into donor populations. The classic example of this is HIV, which emerged in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and it took up to six years for the virus to be identified, the disease understood, a test developed and implemented. Testing is always a reactive strategy, and the mission of Cirrus was to develop a better strategy for dealing with methods to prevent transfusion transmitted infections. Mm -hmm. And if I can just interrupt quickly, I I'm wondering, so you mentioned five to six years was the, the time frame for figuring out how to combat HIV in the blood supply, at least insofar as, as screening for it. I'm wondering, looking and, and zooming in on that, what are some of the reasons why that, that process took so long back then? And, and has anything really changed in terms of a, you know, sort of a, the onset of a, a new virus or new pathogen in the blood supply? What is the underlying infrastructure for being able to get to the root of the problem and develop some sort of test? Or uh, is that kind of of something that is getting phased out for what is ostensibly a more proactive approach with your technology? So if we go back to recent history, which I think is very instructive about what happened. So until 1971, we only had one test for prevention of infectious disease due to blood transfusion, and that was the test for syphilis. In 1971, 
the hepatitis B virus was discovered and a test was developed. And then a number of years went by and we were dealing with another form of hepatitis called non-A, non-B, and we recognized that it was hepatitis C virus. And finally, in 1994, that virus was isolated in a test developed. And uh, HIV first started to be recognized as a clinical syndrome in 1978, but the virus was not isolated until 1984, and then a test developed. So the problem that has been recurrent is that when new infectious diseases emerge, first of all, they may not always be recognized as being transfusion transmitted, which was certainly the case with HIV. Secondly, the pathogen has to be isolated and identified, and that sometimes takes a considerable amount of time, although in recent years with newer technologies, that process has become much faster. But after the virus is identified, a suitable diagnostic test for blood donor screening has to be developed. It has to be taken through the regulatory process because FDA regulates the testing of blood donors. And then that test has to be commercialized and implemented into blood centers. So there is always an inherent lag time between recognition of a new infectious agent, potential for transmission by blood transfusion, and the development of a test to interdict this agent. We've gotten better at it, but for example, recently we had the epidemic of Zika, and it took a few years to develop a test for Zika. And one of the limitations is that frequently manufacturers of these tests may not see sufficient economic return on investment. And so, for example, for viruses like dengue and chikungunya, there are are not widespread use of tests that have been licensed in all regions mm. because the return on investment just isn't there. And we are seeing every year, we know that there are approximately five new viruses with potential to be transfusion transmitted that are identified somewhere in the world that enter the blood donor population. But tests are not developed for all of these. So the basic problem is that testing is inherently a reactive strategy. And our approach going back to the HIV epidemic was to develop a technology which is proactive and very broad spectrum so that you don't even need to know the specific structure of the pathogen. And that's based upon a very basic principle that for the most part, all of the bloodborne infectious agents, viruses, bacteria, protozoan parasites, all have to be able to replicate their DNA and RNA, the genetic code, in order to cause an infection. And if you can target inactivation of that genetic code, then you can prevent replication and you can prevent infection. And the advantage in dealing with blood components is that platelets, plasma, and red cells either contain trace amounts of DNA and RNA, and they don't need to replicate it in order to deliver their therapeutic function. So you can inactivate DNA and RNA and inactivate the pathogens without impacting the therapeutic effect of the platelets, the plasma, or the red cells right. if you have the right technology. Right, right. I see. So this is a, you know, in some way is is sort of a a panacea to, you know, you, you don't have to understand necessarily the the underlying biology of the pathogen, but this is kind of a, an approach to, and I think you outlined it well there, which is, you know, we, the, the idea is to be able to get to a, a method where you can proactively kind of inactivate the the pathogen instead of having to to deal with that lag time, which has, has defined the cycle of discovering something, developing a test for it, and then hoping that that, is, that test is economically viable. So, you know, this is just representing a kind of a, a new paradigm in terms of screening and, and effectively inactivating whatever the pathogen ends up being. And as you said, I think you said five new pathogens a, a, a year, and this is, this is worldwide. Is that, is that right? That's correct. And this process has been speeded up by global warming, climate change, and 
the effective spread of insect vectors. So a lot of these pathogens we call arboviruses because they are carried by insects and uh, mosquitoes, for example. And we now know that in the United States, the spread of mosquitoes northward is such that in Washington, D.C., in the metro tunnels, you can acquire insect-carried infections because the mosquitoes are surviving through the winters in the metro tunnels in Washington, D.C. I see. So would it be the, the right way to think about it would be a continuation of warming uh, as well as kind of the, the growing interconnectivity between, say, foreign travel or just moving back and forth is actually setting this up to be even more crucial looking forward for the kind of the, the appearance of new pathogens. Yes, I think that's exactly right. I mean, there are a couple of very cogent examples. So, for example, in uh, the uh, recent years, Zika virus initially was thought not to be a very important human pathogen when it was discovered in 1954 in a rainforest in Uganda in primates. And then it surfaced in the South Pacific Islands and around 2011 and rapidly moved across the South Pacific due to travel of humans into South America and then up through South America into the Caribbean and ultimately into the United States. And of course, this was in part enabled by insect vectors and also humans carrying the disease. But it's also interesting in that when Zika emerged in French Polynesia, the intercept pathogen reduction technology was being used by the blood center in French Polynesia to deal with dengue virus, which is an inherent problem in that region and for which there are no good diagnostic tests. And they were able, by using the same technology, to show that they could protect against Zika virus infection through transfusion of platelets and plasma. So with one technology, they were able to deal with a new emerging pathogen because they had the technology that had been put into place to deal with another pathogen, which points to the broad spectrum of protection that you get as opposed to testing, which is generally focused on a single pathogen, a single test. And it always leads to the question of how many tests can you implement mm -hmm. in a blood transfusion center in order to deal with each new potential pathogen. Whereas with pathogen reduction technology, which is nucleic acid targeted, you have a very broad spectrum against a wide array of pathogens before you may even know the specific nucleic acid structure of that pathogen, as opposed to a test where you have to isolate the virus or the pathogen, know its nucleic acid structure to design an appropriate test. Right. I see. Okay. That makes sense. So just zooming in uh, a little bit, I know, at least from the perspective of, of someone who has donated blood before, and, and I've, you know, I've seen friends and family go through kind of similar processes. I just want to make sure that people kind of are understanding when we look at that process of, of donating blood and these blood products are, are separated out. I want to zoom in and just talk a little bit about the intercept technology as it relates to platelets. I think this is one of the products that most people are, are familiar with. So if you wouldn't mind maybe just refreshing a little bit the therapeutic indication uh, for platelets. And I'm also curious on that, how various different regulatory bodies have approached the specifically the kind of the, the bacterial issue that is persistent uh, within the, the, the platelet space. So platelets are the smallest cell or more correctly, a fragment of a cell that's generated in the bone marrow that's in the bloodstream. And they're very important for basically preventing bleeding. And if you do have either a spontaneous bleeding event or an event due to trauma or surgical intervention, the platelet is your first line of defense because it is the cell which basically sticks to the damaged blood vessel and initiates the clotting of blood in a very efficient manner to stem bleeding. So platelets are critical. The normal platelet count in your blood is about 150,000 platelets 
we say per microliter of blood. And we know that when your platelet count falls down below about 50,000, you will start to get spontaneous bleeding from trauma. And when it goes down below 10,000, then you can have quite a lot of spontaneous bleeding. And below 5,000, everybody will start to bleed from their intestinal tract, from their gut, because platelets also are what maintain Mm -hmm. uh, the integrity of the blood vessels that line all of your circulation and prevent blood from leaking out of your blood vessels into other tissues, which essentially is is a bleeding event. So platelets are a critical supportive therapy for patients who undergo major surgical procedures, have trauma, may have immune destruction of their platelets due to a variety of diseases, get treated with cancer therapies, because when you treat patients with cancer therapies, one of the side effects is that you also impact the production of platelets, and so you have low platelet counts. And so these patients have to be protected with what we call prophylactic transfusions during their chemotherapy period. And if they get a bone marrow transplant, have to be protected until their new bone marrow recovers. So platelet transfusion therapy really came into being in the late 1960s and early 70s. Prior to that time, we didn't have good technology for separating them out of whole blood and providing them as a specialized transfusion product that we call a platelet concentrate at a dose sufficient to effectively raise the platelet count in a person with a low platelet count. Starting around uh, 1985, because platelets have to be stored at room temperature and have a limited shelf life of between five and seven days because of their metabolism, Mm -hmm. platelets also, if contaminated with bacteria, can allow those bacteria during storage to replicate and grow to levels that can cause a very serious transfusion-transmitted infection that we call sepsis. Now, the question is, how do those bacteria get into blood products? Well, theoretically, the bloodstream of a donor is sterile. Right. But that's not always the case because we know that, for example, every time we brush our teeth, or we have a bowel movement, we get small showers of bacteria that come into our bloodstream. In addition, when you draw blood from somebody, you have to go through the skin. And although the skin is prepared and sterilized for blood drawing, the deeper layers of the skin are very hard to sterilize. And so we know that about one in 1,000 blood products that are collected contain small amounts of bacteria. And in platelets stored at room temperature for up to five or seven days, those bacteria can divide and replicate and multiply. And starting around 1985, people really began to focus on serious bacterial infections that were being transmitted by platelet transfusion. And the first thing that the FDA did was that they decided to roll the storage time back from seven days to five days so that there was less time for bacterial replication. Over the next 10 years, people began to systematically take samples from platelet products and culture them and come to understand what the level of contamination was And I would say that although prevention of transfusion transmitted septic events, which are serious infections, is very important, one has to think about the fact that no intravenous biological or medication actually should contain bacteria because platelets and blood products go into people whose immune systems are damaged and they're very susceptible to infections. And these infections can appear many days or sometimes even months after a transfusion. So they're poorly linked to the actual transfusion. And the standards for other intravenous medications are that they should be sterilized and not contain any bacteria. Mm. That's, That's an FDA standard. But there was no technology available for blood products. 
until we actually developed the intercept technology that could inactivate platelets and uh, inactivate bacteria rather and leave the platelet function intact. The benefit of this technology is that it also inactivates viruses, all of the bloodborne viruses that can be transmitted by transfusion sure, sure. thus far, and also inactivates parasites like the parasite that causes malaria and also does inactivate one of the cells that are in blood products, a white blood cell called a T cell, which have to be inactivated for certain types of patients to prevent something called transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease, which is a very serious immune complication of transfusion, where if T cells, a type of white blood cell from a donor, is transfused to a recipient, those cells can multiply and ultimately result in a fatal type of disease called graft-versus-host disease. So the conventional way to deal with that has been to use what we call gamma irradiation, nuclear source irradiation, but intercept, because it's nucleic acid targeted, also achieves this very effectively mm -hmm. and in fact has replaced gamma irradiation in many parts of the world to prevent graft versus host disease. So the point is that there are multiple benefits of this technology sure, sure. for inactivation of bacteria, viruses, protozoans, and also T cells. And in contrast to testing, where testing only takes a small sample from a donor or from a blood product and tests it, with pathogen reduction technology such as Intercept, you're treating the whole product. I see. So you can think of it in the same way that we pasteurize milk to prevent transmission of bovine tuberculosis. We don't test the milk. We mm -hmm. pasteurize it. And other intravenous medications are sterilized by various pasteurization techniques that leave the therapeutic product intact, but inactivate bacteria or viruses. Right. And and just to tie two things together that we that we had mentioned, you know, all of this is spoken in the context of of an FDA regulated environment. I mean, we've talked about five to seven day shelf life and and sterile blood collection infrastructure. I'm just imagining, you know, in in the context of what we just discussed about the global economy and and interconnectivity between different nations, you know, I would imagine in in lesser developed countries that don't necessarily have the same sort of systematic infrastructure for blood collection and the same sterile technique or same sterile environment, this highlights even more the importance of being able to have a system that is more proactive, especially uh, you know with the with the backdrop of of new diseases coming up that we're not necessarily built out to handle. Yes, I think that's a very good point. I think one of the things that the intercept pathogen reduction or pathogen inactivation technology does is it creates a, a uniform standard of how to prepare a blood product. So for testing of blood products, what one can see is a lot of variation between different countries in terms of the type of tests that might be used or how the tests are actually applied. Now, in general, in Western and more developed countries, there is a what I would call a global standard of care for application of some of the testing strategies, for example, for HIV, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus. But in terms of bacteria protection, it's highly variable. And in some countries, intercept technology has been mandated for all platelet products. So in Switzerland, in France, in Belgium, in Kuwait, for example, the use of intercept to prevent bacterial contamination of platelet products has been mandated. In the United States, the FDA regulates all the establishments that collect and prepare blood for transfusion and also regulate the um, hospital transfusion services. But going back to the story of bacteria, in 1985, the FDA rolled the storage time back from seven days to five days to try to deal with the problem of serious bacterial infections related to platelet transfusion. But nothing more really happened until 2004, 
except that during that period of time, the medical literature began to contain more and more reports describing bacterial contamination of platelet products. And people started using a variety of different methods, none of which were licensed by the FDA, to detect bacteria and prevent the transfusion of contaminated platelet components. In 2004, the NIH and FDA held a workshop on various methodologies and the only result of that workshop was that the American Association of Blood Banks, which accredits blood banks and hospital transfusion services, put forward an accreditation standard that said you must do something to mitigate the risk of bacterial contamination of platelets. But they did not specify any specific technology. They just presented a range of technologies that might be useful. The FDA did not propose or start to propose specific regulations until eight years later in 2012. And in 2014, put out the first guidance, draft guidance document on specific procedures that blood centers should use to mitigate the risk of platelet transfusion sepsis due to bacteria. Simultaneously with that, they licensed the intercept pathogen and activation technology in the United States and said that it was one of the ways that you could deal with this problem. Subsequently, there were at least three additional draft guidance documents, and it was not until September 30th of 2019, this year, that the FDA put out the final guidance document, which is a legal requirement for blood centers to implement specific strategies, among which is the pathogen reduction technology of Intercept, but also giving blood centers options to use very much improved and enhanced bacterial culturing tests to mitigate the risk of bacterial contamination. But those tests only deal with bacteria, whereas Intercept deals with bacteria, viruses, protozoan parasites, and also T cells. So you get much more bang for the buck, if you will, with Intercept than one of these other bacterial testing strategies. But blood centers are highly regulated by the FDA. All blood centers in the United States operate under licenses, and they have to have special licenses when they want to ship blood products interstate, because the FDA regulates interstate commerce in blood products. And so that requires a special type of license. And blood products are very mobile. They move all around the United States because we really operate a national blood supply. And you have organizations like the American Red Cross, which is basically a national organization for provision of blood products. Sure. So if you wouldn't mind, you know, we, we've brought up the the previous draft guidances. And I, I think reading through those, especially the one that was was put out in, in 2012, or excuse me, in, in 2014, it seems like the suggestion that that pathogen inactivation intercept was was something that was written on the wall, for lack of a better expression. But you've mentioned the the recent final FDA guidance, and so one thing that I just quickly want to draw the distinction between is just for the people who aren't necessarily familiar with the way that these documents are are presented and how that affects both blood centers and hospitals. Would you mind maybe breaking out the difference between a draft guidance and a final guidance document, and what exactly this means in terms in terms of the dynamics, say, of the adoption of intercept technology or, or, or pathogen inactivation generally? Yes, I think it's very, it's certainly an arcane part of the regulatory world. But I think that when the FDA puts out a, a draft guidance, it represents what they would say is FDA's thinking about a problem. And some draft guidances never become final guidance documents but they do express what FDA is thinking. So one example for it is how to treat blood products to prevent transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease. And in 1993, the FDA put out a draft guidance document saying that if you're going to use nuclear source irradiation, then you need to use an irradiator that delivers a dose 
of 2500 centigrade to the mid plane of your blood product. And they had some other specifications and indicated how often you needed to recalibrate your blood irradiator. That guidance was never taken to final guidance, but it represents the thinking of the FDA and everybody essentially complies with that guidance. The guidance on bacteria is really a seminal event in a certain sense because the FDA took that to a final guidance in 2019 and put forward in that guidance very specific procedures, what they called single step procedures or double step procedures. And the single step procedures are one technique for bacterial culture screening called large volume delayed sampling. And the other alternative is the intercept pathogen reduction technology. The two step strategies require the first step to be achieved in the blood center. And then when the blood center issues the blood product, the platelet product to a hospital, the hospital then will have to do a second level of testing prior to transfusion to comply with that FDA guidance. So this is the first time in this area where FDA has put forward very detailed, very specific procedures. For the viruses, they've also licensed tests and they've indicated what you should do for hepatitis virus, for HIV, et cetera. But they give people a choice of, of the way to implement these various options. But this is a very specific guidance document, quite unusual and different from other documents that they have issued in the past. And it's a final document. And I've been asked the question, well, what happens if a blood center doesn't comply or a hospital doesn't comply? Well, hospitals and blood centers operate under biologic licenses from FDA or from state authorities. And failure to comply certainly would result in a, what's called a 483 or a, a lack of compliance notice from the FDA or a state agency, and ultimately a warning letter or ultimately a consent decree and being shut down. But I think the other side of it is litigation risk, because now what FDA has done by issuing this guidance document is established a standard of care. And to be below that standard then would be negligent and would open an institution up to litigation due to medical malpractice negligence. I see. So if I'm a hospital administrator and I'm, I'm looking at this document, and in all fairness, you know, I'm, I'm looking at both single step and, you know, two step processes. And, you know, I, I suppose logistically speaking, having to do one step at the blood center and a second at the hospital, I imagine is logistically maybe more complex than the single step strategies. I, I would guess that a, a hospital would want to be able to receive a, a product that had already been either screened or inactivated, depending on the, the single step strategy that is adopted between those two parties. So I suppose I, I'd like to just focus in on some of the single step strategies, unless you think that there's a, a tenable kind of two-step strategy from, from your own conversations with hospitals or blood centers. But for the, the single step strategies, you mentioned large volume delayed sampling or, or LVDS. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that that is specifically for bacterial culture screening. And so I, I want to just quickly kind of highlight some of the differences between Intercept and, and LVDS and kind of the, the dynamics that would determine which of those two might be more attractive for a healthcare system. Yes, I think it's a very important point because it has all sorts of ramifications in terms of the availability of of platelet components and, and the quality of platelet components. So the single step strategies are, as you said, large volume delayed sampling. This requires that after a platelet component is collected, it's held in quarantine for 48 hours at the blood center. And then at that point, 10 milliliters and a typical platelet component is, consists of about 300 milliliters. So 10 milliliters is taking, taken for what we call aerobic culture and 10 for anaerobic culture. And those bacterial cultures are started. And if they're negative 12 hours later, then 
that 60 hours after collection of the blood product, the blood product is then allowed to be sent to a hospital for transfusion. But it's labeled as negative to date. And the cultures continue. They have to be held until the expiration of the platelet component. And right now, with the large volume delayed sampling technique, the expiration date is still five days from collection. There is a license application pending to extend that to seven days, but the device for that has yet to receive final licensure by FDA. So those cultures have to be followed for the full five days from time of collection. The platelets then are sitting at the hospital in inventory. They can be transfused. If a culture turns positive, and that happens because some bacteria are very slow growing, then the blood center has to recall that blood product from the hospital and destroy it. Or if the product has been transfused, then they have to notify the physician, notify the patient, and take appropriate evaluation and corrective action, evaluating the patient, perhaps instituting antibiotics, and following that patient. So there are costs involved in terms of maintaining all of those cultures, personnel to monitor them, and then medical personnel to interact with the hospitals and ultimately with, with the patients. The large volume delayed sampling method has been used in the UK, the United Kingdom, for some years as a methodology and also has been used to some extent in Canada. And one of the things that it has shown us in practice is that the average age then of a platelet product is somewhere between five and six days when it's actually transfused. So because of the quarantine and the holding for the initial culture, you're transfusing platelets that are towards the end of their useful shelf life. If you calculate the sort of what we would call the useful transfusion life of those platelet products, it's about five and a half days under the most optimal uh, setting if you have a seven-day expiration for your product. If it's only a five-day expiration, then you're looking at about three and a half days. Mm -hmm. And just to, so if I'm a blood center administrator or if I'm, I'm working in a hospital and I'm the point person for reading and, and looking over and complying with this new FDA final guidance, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that the the end of the the compliance period is is March 31st of, of 2021. And so thinking about the time between now and then, I'm curious about, you know, again, why I as an administrator would kind of want to be on the, say, the, the vanguard of compliance and, and want to switch over whatever I'm doing, whether it's screening or LVDS and, and over to a pathogen inactivation technology like Intercept. I mean, I imagine there is some logistical difficulty with, with switching that out and adopting that. And I'm just curious to learn a little bit more about why people would want to be kind of a, an early adopter of this. What benefits might they have for offering a pathogen inactivated product versus, say, what has, has potentially become kind of a, a commoditized blood market product? Sure. So let's talk about Intercept for a moment, because to understand the considerations that a, that a hospital administrator or risk manager would go through. So the Intercept technology treats platelet components within the first 24 hours of collection, which means that those products can be released for transfusion really on the first day of collection, within 12 hours of collection. So number one, it's a fresher product. Number two, there are no subsequent steps required. There's no culturing required. There's no follow-up required. The product is issued to the hospital and has a useful shelf life with the current five-day label in the United States of at least four and a half days. And we have a clinical trial which is now running, which will support a label extension out to seven days. So the hospital receives a final product, no follow-up required, and the blood center is not required to do any follow-up. There are no cultures to be monitored and or followed. Now, the question is, you know, why should I switch now as opposed to uh, can I wait until, uh, you know, early 2021? Well, about 20% of the 
blood centers in the United States today are already issuing intercept platelets. But that means that 80% of them are still using pre-FDA guidance technology with what now are known to be inadequate bacterial culturing techniques. But FDA has given people this window of time to implement. But I would say that these products are relatively unsafe. And I think that hospitals are motivated, since the technologies are licensed and approved, to get into these technologies to protect their patients, to avoid the threat of litigation if something bad were to happen with a suboptimal product. In addition to which, particularly with Intercept, one gains other benefits in that you can stop doing gamma irradiation. So you avoid that procedure and Intercept provides the inactivation of T cells. You no longer would need to test for a virus called CMV, which is important for certain type of immune suppressed patients because your entire inventory would be CMV safe. You would no longer have to test for a parasite called Babesia, which is a problem in some parts of the United States and is transmitted by ticks and causes serious infections. And you don't have to test for Zika using these platelet products. So you're realizing the immediate benefit of avoiding several other procedures for cost. In addition, with the Intercept technology, Cirrus has been able to get a premium reimbursement from the Center for Medicaid, Medicare Services for this product, which applies to outpatient transfusions, which operate under something called P codes or HIPPIC codes. And they have gotten a very good uh, hospital reimbursement price for this to cover the cost of this technology. It's not clear, because it hasn't happened yet, that CMS will give large volume delayed sampling a premium for using that technology because it's just an enhanced method of testing. It's actually not a new type of blood product. And they tend to give premium codes for new types of blood products. So we don't know yet what that reimbursement could be. And clearly, there are costs for large volume delayed sampling, which will have to be passed along from blood center to hospital. The blood centers have been able to provide intercept platelets to hospitals at a premium mm -hmm. and get paid for it. And that's good for the blood centers because in the past, they have not always gotten appropriately reimbursed for enhanced safety measures. For inpatient transfusions, blood products are compensated under what are called DRGs or disease-related payment groups. There's a lump sum payment. The hospitals basically are getting adequate reimbursement for intercept platelets, not only for the outpatient platelets, but also from insurers to cover these products as well. So they're benefiting by having a premium product as opposed to a commodity platelet product and realizing some economic benefit to cover their costs. So it's an improvement in patient safety. It's an improvement in logistics. It's an improvement in regulatory compliance. And it also improves the economic landscape for both blood centers and for hospitals, quite frankly. Right. And I want to just zoom out quickly beyond the compliance period for the FDA final guidance. And I, I want to just quickly discuss the other areas or other types of blood products that can be amenable to intercept and, and pathogen reduction technology and some of the clinical use cases of, of things like plasma and, and red blood cells. I, I want to just kind of zoom out maybe over a, a five-year time span and, and discuss the, the roadmap and, and what these other things can be uh, potentially useful for down the road? So the intercept technology that we use for platelets is also applicable to plasma. Just to inform your listeners a little bit, it uses a small molecule derived from a class of plant molecules called sorolins. So there's a history of chronic human exposure, but the sorolin that we use in the intercept system for platelets and plasma, we've synthesized and optimized. And then it uses what we call UVA light. That's a, a light source, the same wavelength that gives you a suntan that activates this compound. So the same platform 
can be used for platelets and plasma. And so the Intercept platelet and plasma technology is licensed in Europe and in the United States and other large parts of the world to use for production of plasma as well as platelets. The plasma technology has not yet been rolled out in the United States because Cirrus decided to transition the plastic containers into a type of plastic container that are called DEHP free because the transfusion medicine world wants to get away from this type of plasticizer for safety reasons. So we transitioned all of our plastics and delayed release of the plasma system in the United States which will happen in 2020 because we've now transitioned that. But we've been marketing Intercept Plasma in Europe and in the Middle East since 2005. So the system also supports treatment of plasma. And plasma is also used to make a specialized blood component called cryoprecipitate. Now, plasma is used to support patients with bleeding disorders, patients undergoing major surgical procedures, organ transplants, patients who may have impaired blood clotting. It's used by the military in treatment of combat trauma. Cryoprecipitate is derived from plasma and is enriched for a protein we call fibrinogen, which forms the basis of your clot. And so Intercept Cryoprecipitate is currently licensed in the United States and Europe, and it can be prepared. But cryoprecipitate has traditionally had a what we call a post-thaw shelf life of four to six hours due to concerns about potential bacterial contamination. We now have developed a product which will be submitted for licensure in the United States in the first half of 2020 which extends the post-thaw shelf life at room temperature of cryoprecipitate from four to six hours to five days. Now, why is that important? Well, cryoprecipitate is basically thawed and used today on demand, and that means there's a delay in delivering it to hospital emergency rooms and operating rooms And once thawed, if it's not used, it has to be thrown out. So there's a very high wastage rate, about 25% wastage rate. And cryoprecipitate is very expensive. It's about five to $600 a dose. And so that's a very costly procedure when you have to throw it away. The Intercept cryo, which FDA has agreed to a licensing requirement that would allow five days of post-thaw storage, then would provide much more flexibility in that you could keep this thawed in a hospital emergency room, Wow! have it available mm-hmm. in operating uh, room areas of your hospital and move it around and use it for up to five days. So you would have vastly reduced wastage rates. In addition, it could be used pre-hospital. So it could be put onto an ambulance or a helicopter. And the military is very interested in it because it could be used early in medical evacuations closer to the point of injury. So intercept cryoprecipitate, we think, is a, a very innovative type of product which would be introduced in, beginning in, in the second half of, of 2020 when FDA finishes its, its review. We have a separate technology for dealing with red cells. Red cell concentrates are not amenable to treatment with light because the red color of hemoglobin absorbs light. And so we've developed another molecule that we call amustoline or S303, which also targets nucleic acids, can be added to red blood cells, inactivates bacteria, viruses, protozoans, and also T cells. And this technology has now uh, completed phase three clinical trials in Europe, and a European CE mark application is, is currently under review in Europe. And in the United States, phase three clinical trials are going on now with this technology under an FDA concurrent development program. One of the things that's remarkable about the red cell program is that uh, when Zika virus broke out in Puerto Rico in 2016, because the red cell supply was so impacted by Zika virus in Puerto Rico, the Department of Health and Human Services 
division that's known as BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Development Research Authority, came to Cirrus and asked us if we could put the red cell technology into Puerto Rico on an emergency basis. And we said we could do that, provided that we had adequate funding to help us take this technology all the way through FDA regulatory approval. And BARDA ultimately awarded us a, a contract for $205 million, which is today supporting the phase three clinical development of the red cell technology in the United States for registration of that product. We also have a small program for treating whole blood. There's not much whole blood that's used in the United States, but the S303 red cell technology is applicable to whole blood. And the Swiss Red Cross, which is a customer of Cirrus for platelets and plasma, has a humanitarian program for lesser developed countries where whole blood is used. And they have provided 5 million Swiss francs to fund the development of this program in collaboration with the Swiss Red Cross. And we are about to start a phase one slash phase two clinical trial in the Ivory Coast with the Swiss Red Cross using intercept treated whole blood for patients with anemia. So the basic platform of nucleic acid targeted compounds to inactivate infectious pathogens in blood is applicable to platelets, plasma, crop precipitate, red blood cells, and, and whole blood. So it provides a, a way to protect all of the important blood component transfused products. Mm, I see. And just being respectful of your, of your time here, I wanted to quickly kind of end by discussing a little bit about, given everything that we've discussed so far, if there's anything that you in particular are excited or interested to see develop, say, in the next one to two years, both from the perspective of, of someone on the C-suite of, of Cirrus, but also just personally, especially given your history uh, as a physician and, and your kind of perspective, given that you've been on both ends of this problem, both as someone who has you know worked tirelessly to solve it, but also someone who's been in the trenches and has experienced the issue of, of, of sepsis and some of the issues that, that you've described and that you've laid out here? Well, it's an interesting point. My career, fortunately, basically spans the, the recent modern history of blood transfusion. So when I was a medical intern at Bellevue Hospital in 1969, uh, we had only a single test for transfusion transmitted infections. That was the test for syphilis. Two years later, when I arrived at the NIH in 19. 71, we had the first test for hepatitis B virus, and then other tests followed. But my career really was impacted in 1978 when I saw my first case of HIV, which I did not know what it was at the NIH. It was a young man with severe immune deficiency, ultimately turned out to be due to HIV. And I moved to San Francisco in 1982 to run one of the hematology services. And in a very short period of time, I had a large number of patients with transfusion transmitted HIV. And that's how I got interested in this whole problem and started doing research in the area that ultimately led to uh, the development of the Intercept technology and the founding of Cirrus. So it's very exciting to see this technology move from the research laboratory with the first device that was built from hardware store parts for $75 into a technology which is becoming the standard of care in many countries. And I think is offering us an improved way to have a much broader spectrum of blood transfusion safety and something which is prospective. One of the areas now that we're focusing on at Cirrus is developing new types of products that can further improve the availability of, of blood transfusion therapy. And that is that for platelets, we have a collaboration project with another country to make a type of freeze-dried platelet that could be moved around more easily. We have a program to make freeze-dried plasma. The French military blood service has already used intercept plasma to make freeze-dried plasma, which is stable for two years. 
can be resuspended in sterile water in three minutes and has been used by the French military, special operations medics, and also by the U.S. military in Afghanistan and other overseas areas to treat wounded military personnel. We're developing that product for the United States market. We're also working on freeze-dried cryoprecipitate, which we think would be able to be used pre-hospital by the military. You know, in the United States, unfortunately, we have a mass casualty shooting event almost every day, and sometimes these involve very large numbers of patients. And so the ability to deliver blood products to the point of injury, especially plasma and cryoprecipitate, because we know from recent studies that if you can deliver these products in the first 30 minutes after injury, you can dramatically improve survivability. And that's for both plasma and cryoprecipitate. So we think that there are tremendous opportunities for these new types of products to improve blood transfusion safety and availability to improve outcomes for a wide variety of patients affected by either their basic disease for which they're receiving therapy or organ transplants or for the unfortunate event of severe traumatic injury. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. It's got to be kind of tremendously rewarding to have the perspective of being able to see kind of the origin of this issue and and follow it through to, you know, what has become a, a tenable and, and widespread and really innovative approach to dealing with issues with the, uh, with the blood supply. I mean, I, I think of how common of a medical procedure it is and how commonplace it is for, for people to donate blood. And it's one of those issues where people have accepted a, a certain level of, of, of safety without necessarily understanding that the blood supply, especially under the context of, of more interconnectivity and, and more travel and and the, the theme of having global warming as well as the emergence of new pathogens, I think it's just tremendously interesting to be able to take a, a proactive approach that seeks to inactivate a host of different pathogens instead of just one and move away from a, a reactive paradigm. So I just want to thank you for all the time that you've spent and what you're doing at Cirrus, and hopefully we'll we'll speak again soon. Well, my pleasure. I mean, I think the for us the ultimate customer is the patient, and you know, up to seventy percent of us will receive a blood product at some point in our lifetime. And blood centers are faced with an enormous challenge because every day blood donors walk in, and from those blood donors who voluntarily donate their blood, they have to prepare a biologic product which has, in some cases, like platelets, a short shelf life. So they have to keep doing it over and over again. And we know that donors come in with a potential problem of unrecognized infections that can imperil the patients who would receive those blood products. So having a technology that can improve that and make blood transfusion safer and more widely available is very gratifying to see our patients realizing the benefit of that. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Larry. It's a pleasure. Thank you. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.